Hey, hello, and welcome to the show. It's me, JP. It's John Park's workshop. Here I am in my workshop, but soon I'm going to be transported to some magical alternate destinations. Are you excited about this? I am. I'm very excited about this project, in fact. Uh, so let's see. We're up and running. Let me check. Uh, looks like our broadcast stream might be running a little choppy. You let me know. Why is that? That shouldn't be. Uh, but who am I talking to? Well, you. I'm talking to the people over in Discord. If you want to know where the chat is happening, head on over to adafru.it slash discord, and you'll get a free instant invite into Discord. You'll get a free iced coffee. Mm. It's almost empty, darn it. And uh, you can join in on the conversation and enjoy the free coffee. Part of that is true. Part of that is not true. All right, good. Well, we're up and running. We're in sync. Our audio is working and yay. So welcome everyone. Hi, David Odessa, Hugo, Garrett, Andre, Kevin Plays. Uh, we had some questions. That's the people over in the YouTube chat. We had a question earlier about what does retro reflective mean? And we're going to talk about exactly that. Uh, hey, Todd Bott. Hey, C. Grover. Andy Calloway. Chaotic Cosmos. Nice to see you all. I am talking to you. That's right, Hugo. Get your coffee, would you? Hi, Susan. Yes. Mm, iced coffee. All right. Uh, excuse me. <coughs> I shouldn't have run out of the iced coffee. I'm going to need that. Uh, so let's get this uh, party started. So First of all, a couple of little housekeeping details, and then we'll get into the bulk of this project. I'm going to spend most of my time on this today because it's so dang cool. But first, let's uh, mention, we've got a jobs board. You may have heard of it. It is right here at jobs.adafruit.com. And if you head on over there, uh, let's see, where's me? There's me. Hi. Um, put that in the background. That'll work. You will see that we have both the available for hire and the search jobs uh, sections. This is entirely free. All you need is to sign up with an email address, your Adafruit email address if you've placed orders. That'll work too, I believe, for that. And you'll see such things as a listing for the program, commun com program coordinator at Fuse Northwestern University. Hey, what is that? What is Fuse? a STEAM program for middle and high school students based at Northwestern University. Seeks program coordinators passionate about STEAM and equitable access for students. Loves tinkering, making, 3D printing, enjoys working with educators. That sounds tremendous. So that's a full-time job, uh, and I'm assuming that's an in-person one, so not the sort of remote job you sometimes see on here. Anyway, that's just one of the uh, many positions that are open and available there on jobsadatafruit.com. So go, check it out. I invite you to, please. All right, uh, next thing that I will mention is the product pick of the week. So you may know, you may not, I run another show every Tuesday. It is called JP's Product Pick of the Week. Here's the recap, one minute recap, this week's product pick. Check it out. It's the TSL 2591. It is a high dynamic range light sensor. And I've got it plugged in over the Stemma QT cable to this uh, Metro ESP32. What I'm showing is the total lux. If I take a pretty powerful flashlight and point this at the light, uh, I'm gonna jump up to around 300, 400 lux. Okay, what's the difference between this flashlight and let's say the sun? So I've positioned a little hand mirror uh, outside, and you can see my, my hand here kind of blowing out. I'm gonna take the meter uh, and lift that up and put that in the sun. And you can see now we're at around 30,000 lux. That's my product pick. It's the TSL 2591 HDR, high dynamic range light sensor. Man, that's such a groovy song. Uh, written by our own Bartle Beats. Tom White wrote that. I love that song. Uh, all right, so let's get into this. What are we talking about here? What's the deal? Uh, so the product, the, the, rather the project of the week, this is really exciting. So uh, the topic here is chroma keying. And you'll typically hear this referred to as green screen. Uh, in the earlier days, you used to hear this referred to as blue screen for various reasons. The industry, uh, both film and TV, particularly TV at first, uh, for, for 
reasons that I'll get into, switched over to using green screens. But blue-green, uh, both methods of using a colored background uh, behind a, an actor or a subject to uh, make a mat or basically knock out that section of the foreground image so you could see a plate image uh, behind. So that could be a photograph or a, a painting of something in the background. You see it done composited over video now. And of course, all VF, VFX movies tend to use tons and tons of green screen scenes so that you can put actors in places where they didn't actually film or things that, scenes that don't actually exist. Um, so let me show you actually real, let's, let's jump right into it. Let me show you an example of me being green screened. And this is something that um, happens nowadays very frequently in real time. So in, in live broadcasting software, I'm sure a lot of you have used Zoom, which has some, some uh, green screen types of features, even ones that don't require a green screen, which is kind of amazing that it, that it computes it as well as it does. Uh, so here, what we're going to do is I'm going to take this uh, image of the Adafruit factory and let's... Um, Go ahead and knock me out. So now you can see, here I am. I'm in front of the Adafruit factory, at least part of me is. Um, and this is allowing me to put a photograph, which is what I have back there. I have the, this photograph of the Adafruit factory behind me. And uh, my foreground image of me, this real-time video, is being uh, composited in real-time right on top of it. And you can see it's, it's compositing it really nicely. I'm going to talk about some of the, some of the things that, uh, some of my opinions here about what's good and bad in, in a composite, in, in a green screen composite, and issues that can arise with traditional green screen methods that this method that I'm using here today uh, eliminates. So just to show you, we can go to Mars, we can head back to Iceland. Gosh, I miss Iceland. Uh, back to the Adafruit factory. And uh, I can also return here to my workshop. So that is um, something that, you know, you've seen it before. You're probably not too amazed just at the idea of, of a, a green screen happening or a chroma key happening. Um, but something that I've found, and I've, I've done a lot of green screen work over the years and for films, for personal projects, for I, I did some stuff for a high school musical that just took place. So I was doing a lot of compositing, green screen shooting, and then uh, compositing and video editing of actors, including my kids, as well as others. And these were all set up in front of a traditional green screen. So I have a pretty nice uh, large green screen that I've used in the past for this kind of stuff. I'll show you what that looks like. So this is a kind of a modern type of green screen, which is made out of a fleece material. Um, so you can see here, oh, you can't see it because it's being knocked out, right? So this is, this is green screen. The bag is not as good, but the, the green screen material itself, hey, that stuff's great. Um, let me turn off my, my keyer here so that you can actually see it. Hey, look, so, so this material, uh, this is a, a nice one. It's a very even material. It stretches, which helps it get rid of uh, wrinkles because one of the things that happens with green screen, unless you're painting something with, with a chroma key Ultimat, paint, if you're using a, a green screen, the wrinkles in it and shadows cause a lot of problems. So you can imagine what we're trying to do when we're green screening is getting a very consistent surface that's evenly lit and has a, a perfectly consistent hue. And then the software is knocking that out based on hue and saturation and value. Um, so the issue with these are, it, it tends to be two things. One, lighting it evenly. Uh, so I'll, maybe I can share an image, but I've got some Kino Flow boxes or DIY Kino Flow boxes that are essentially really high quality, uh, non-flickering, uh, fluorescent tubes in, in sets of like six of them or five or six that I point at a green screen in the background and then you light the actor separately. You don't want the green screen lighting to spill onto the actor because that causes green halos all over the place. And you don't want to have the actor cast shadows on the green screen. You can see here, the screen that I'm using, this material, because we're lighting me with a key light over here, we're getting shadows. 
this is a real pain in the neck on a traditional green screen. And so what you uh, end up trying to do is move the actor as far from that green screen as possible so that you're, you're lighting the actor without casting shadows. You can't really light frontally. You have to get angles so that the throw of the shadows misses the green screen. Same with the bouncing light. You, you don't want the light that's illuminating the green screen to bounce onto the actor's back. You get little green halos around the hair. So that's on a traditional green screen. Those are two big issues. And, and you, you see it all the time with, with green screen shots where there's just a little bit of a green halo showing up or um, sort of blurring in between crevices because of having to desaturate those to try to fix the, the problems with that, as well as little um, noise that you'll see in the shadow parts of the green screen unless it's very carefully uh, adjusted with things like pedestal and shadow uh, settings in your software. These are things that you can do if you're compositing for a final render, so it's non-real time. So that's the kind of work that I've been doing recently. But in a case like a real-time green screen, you don't have as many controls because those, those types of things take a lot of compute power and time to process. And, and in real time, we're trying to get 30 or 60 frames a second or 120 even. Um, so enter the retro reflective green screen. So what the heck is this? What's going on? Uh, retro reflective material is the same stuff that you have in safety garments like vests that a worker wears on the side of the road or the stripes on your sneakers that when a car headlight, for example, hits that material, the light is returned directly back to the source and you see these glowing running shoes or, you know, track pants stripes. Um, what I'll do right now is I'm going to take a flashlight and I'm going to point it at this screen. And what you'll see is, okay, we're illuminating it. That's nothing special. But watch what happens when I point it at the same axis as the lens. Retroreflective screen, just from a little flashlight this far away, can essentially be fully illuminated really brightly. Look how bright that's coming back. So this is the material here. You can see me moving that around. Uh, I can even have wrinkles in this material, and those are going to disappear. So you'll see those are gone. It returns the light so brightly. It has such, I think it's something like a 95% return. It's like little mirrors. Uh, and the way this is made is this was originally, I think, pioneered by 3M, and like so many materials are. And uh, it's composed of tiny glass beads, and the glass beads refract light straight back, almost perfectly straight back to the source through some internal refractions, uh, and then it bounces and reflects back out. Um, so that's what retroreflective screen is. What am I doing to create this green screen? So here, let's, let's look at the effect again. I'm going to turn on my uh, chroma key here. Boom. I just made that disappear. And you'll notice if I push on this screen, I'm not creating any shadows. I, I can actually bend this material. Nothing bad is happening. Also, this over here, that is a, a piece of screen that's at the back of my workshop. This one is right, right behind me. And something that's really fascinating and super helpful about this style of, of uh, retroreflective screen is that this works better the closer the subject is to it. And this is something that's of great interest to me because at least this year, and it's, maybe I'm a little late on this, but this year with uh, people filming inside of their homes in bedrooms and, and studies in houses, they don't have the luxury of deep spaces to put a green screen way far back. Uh, I wish I had this a month ago when I had started doing a bunch of this green screen work for the, for the high school because this is far superior. Uh, you can be right up on it, and the closer you are, the better. In fact, as I get further from it, we'll start to see some issues, maybe. Okay, yeah, actually, I'm just getting so much green bounce on my hand there, so, so my hand is now green and bouncing. But you'll, you'll see the fall off of the green LEDs that, is, that are pointed at the screen 
don't affect me at all. Unless I tilt my glasses up and you can see those little white circles in there, those are actually uh, seeing through. Those, watch those circles change color when I change the background. So those are actually punching through. So those are, those are chroma keying um, the reflections in my glasses. Um, but let's talk about, well, how's this working? What, what the heck is going on here? What's the, what's the trick? Um, I'm going to show you the trick. It's a NeoPixel ring. And if I turn off my chroma keyer for a second, it'll stop. Uh, oops, wrong one, sorry. It'll stop punching through the green. So this is a green NeoPixel ring. Uh, I, I'm using a larger one than I really need. You can get away with a, I've used a 16 on this and it works fine. It's enough light. Uh, but this is big enough to fit around a camera lens. So the camera I'm using here is just a tiny, uh, you know, pinhole dot on a, on a, uh, computer on the computer monitor bezel, but I also have my real camera with uh, real lenses on it, and this fits over that, so this is a good size. Um, and what I'm using here, in fact, I'm going to put this in the overhead for a second and show you, where's my down shooter? There's my down shooter. I'll show you. Okay, so what I've got here are a QD Pi plugged into this NeoPixel ring. So I have power, ground, and data. And I have this very cool Todd Kurt. Our friend Todd Kurt came up with this method of plugging a rotary encoder knob directly into the back of the QD Pi and reassigning some pins so that everything works out just magically. Uh, and so we have this very compact little thing. In fact, I've got more uh, size from my right angle USB-C connector than I do from the actual device. And I'll plug that in directly. It's a little more svelte. Uh, so what I've got on here is, I'm going to show you in a second, I've got some CircuitPython code that allows me to dim. Oh, it wrapped around. I have it wrapping wrap around. Uh, so this is the dimmest I'm going to get with this. It's a little dimmer than works. Uh, and I can go all the way to full brightness on this. Um, and remember I mentioned earlier green screen and blue screen. So Blue screening can be really effective. Um, I believe in broadcast, analog broadcast TV, there, were, there may have been more uh, bits of data, essentially, available in the green channel, so it was smart to move to that. But blue worked great for many years. Uh, I've, I've also read, I was just reading the Wikipedia on this, that weather, weather men and their blue suits caused the, a switch in the... Uh, in the weatherman news TV chroma key industry to move towards green from blue. Um, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but, but it's an option. So um, I actually, again, in this play that I just worked on, this, this, uh, this musical theater show, it was Avenue Q, which involves human actors and puppets. Uh, one of the puppets has a lot of green in it, and so it became a little tricky over a green screen. It should have been shot over a blue screen. That would have been ideal. It became a little tricky to deal with not desaturating the, the puppet. It wasn't the same green, but uh, that, that made it harder. So a blue screen on some subjects, if you're wearing a green shirt, you, you're not going to want to be in front of a green screen. A blue screen might work better. Um, and those are the two colors, by the way, that tend to be used for uh, many reasons, including they occur in skin tones less than red. You could do a red screen. Uh, people have done magic pink, which is like a magenta screen. In much older days, there were sodium vapor uh, lights used. Uh, but anyway, blue and green, pretty typical. I have white on here just because why not? And this happened to be an RGBW LED and off. Uh, and then I quickly made a little uh, 3D printed ring to hold this so that I could clip it to different things. So for now, I just have a, a, a screw running through here and I'm clipping a clothes pin on there to hang it from my monitor. When I want to put that in front of my camera, I can hang that and put some rubber bands around it. Um, so let me, um, let me demonstrate again what's going on here with, with the green screen. So I'm going to switch my view and turn on chroma key. So right now it's actually attempting to chroma, but it's not finding any green. Let's, let's make sure I'm telling the truth. Yeah, so, so my green bag here... Is, is getting chromed out. Um, what I'd like to do is actually show you a, another view in which I'm not chroma keying. So this top view, the small view of me is not going to chroma. 
and this top, uh, sorry, the, the main image will. And so let's switch this back to green. So you can see I'm, I'm pointing these lights. Uh, you can see it appears green on my hand in the small view, but it's knocked out in the big one. And then I'm going to point this at the screen. Let me get a more dramatic background where you can see it. Uh, let's, put, uh, let's put the factory back there again. So as I go and put this in front of my camera, oh, let's grab the clothespin, pin, otherwise I'm gonna block the camera seat. That should hang on there pretty well. Uh, and now what I can do is adjust my brightness until it just works the best it can. So you, you can see here, if I get too dim, it doesn't look as good. I also don't want to cast any green on me. Uh, and look at the, the one that I'm not chroma keying. You can see that's a really beautiful saturation of green. It's not blown out in whiteness, so that's good. We want, we want more saturation. If you get the lights too bright, uh, I think it tends to, to especially with the automatically adjusting camera. It's kind of amazing, actually, that this works well with a webcam style camera. This is an iMac uh, that I have. Uh, the iMac Pro has a nice camera, but it's, it's, I'm not using any manual controls on it, which typically you're going to fix your exposure, fix your white balance, and, and leave that stuff locked solid so that it doesn't get impacted by the green screen. Um, you can also see, let's see, do I have a, uh, I guess I, I've got this flashlight here. You can also see, as I change the lighting on me, Nothing is changing with the green screen. The green screen isn't getting hit by shadows that we see, which is amazing. If I uh, turn off the, the green screen again for a second, you see I'm, I'm casting huge shadows. This would be a very big problem on a, on a traditional green screen. Retroreflective green screen doesn't care. Oh, there we saw, there we saw it bouncing back. Right? You gotta be careful about that direct line of sight. But if we get a little, just a little bit out of axis of the camera with this light, uh, you can light me all you want get spooky, and it doesn't, doesn't screw up the green screen. Um, so let's go, let's switch over now to uh, the, the other view. So let me hide this one. And if I turn off my chroma for a second, you can see I've got, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that camera view on there. I might not be able to see what's happening too well. But if I head on over here, That's not bad. Like that's actually still working pretty well. Um, I'm guessing there's some problems and some edges because it's so far away and, and sort of off axis a little bit. Um, but if, if the thing looks green and bright to me in my, in my non-chroma view, which is what I'm seeing, uh, I think it probably works really well on the, on the, on the final. I've got a really bright light here, a key light for, for lighting me up and the, and the workbench up. So what I'm gonna do now is, um, first of all, I love this because we have this perfect extension of green screen. You know, they're, they're, they're lit the same in essence. Um, I can go and hide behind a piece of it. You can put like a column in your photo there and come out from behind it. Um, it's really interesting and, and, and wild stuff that you can do with this even in real time. All right, this is, this is not composited later. I didn't pre-film this show. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch over to the... Uh, let's see. Yeah, there's, there's my main cam view. I've got, uh, some wigs and a skull there. So <laughs> those are, the, the hair is tricky, right? The, one of the trickiest things you can have is sort of blondish hair. Um, and that'll, the, the biggest problem you'll see usually is th that you'll get, uh, a green halo. And so let's, let's take a look at what that does. So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead. Um, you can see me here. I'm going to take this and I'm going to wrap a little rubber band around it. Let's set this over my camera. You can see I don't have a finished uh, case for the uh, Cutie Pie and the, and the encoder and the battery yet. It's something I'm working on. Uh, but I'm going to essentially wrap that around my camera. So now you can see it getting a really beautiful uh, chroma. I'm going to get myself out from in front of it and adjust. So there you can see me messing with the, the brightness. So it's at its dimmest level. And I'll start notching that up. 
That's probably pretty good right there. Let's, let's try it. Yeah, let's try it there. So now I'm going to turn on. Say hi to me here. Hello. I'm going to turn on the chroma key here. And I'm going to pick the color. And let me send that over to live. There you go. Okay, so again, we can swap out the background. I'm not actually at the Adafruit factory uh, right there. You can see this, this is actually a little more forgiving because there's a little halo. It's white, though. It's not green, which is nice. It's a little halo around the hair. Um, you'll see it show up more with this background. So let me see, does it... Uh, it can be a combination of tuning the settings in the software and tuning the light. So I'm going to try uh, increasing and decreasing. There we go. So I'm increasing the brightness of the, uh, the NeoPixel ring. And as I do that, the light is getting around that hair and punching through it a little bit better. Let's see. Let me take it all the way to bright. It'll probably pop to the lowest setting if I keep going here. And then I'll go back one notch. Uh, there. Okay, let me go back a couple. There we go. So that's the brightest it'll do. Um, and now I think, yeah, that looks pretty good. Uh, it, it's possible that I can fix that up a little bit in the software too. So let me, uh, let's see if I can, I might screw this up, but let's see. Repick the color and then I'm going to goose the threshold a little bit. No, that's going to start screwing it up horribly. In fact, picking the color when it's at that full brightness didn't work as well. So let me lower this a bit, repick that color. I'm just using a kind of like an eyedropper to pick the color. Yeah, that's a little more saturated choice now. And I'll crank that back up. Okay, so not bad. Uh, but what, what we might find is that that's actually a little bit far away from that green screen there. Um, let me see, is there another view I can use? I don't think I have a good way to show you that. But let me, I'm going to step over there, and what we should see is that I, I, will knock, uh, I will get knocked out of that background better than this wig and skull, because the wig and skull have about five or six feet in front of, oh, maybe four feet in front of the, the background. If I head on over here, I think I probably look better than that does, and if I bring this towards the screen, I imagine the same thing. Again, I can't see it too well from here, but I think that the halo starts to drop out just uh, based on the, the, the pluses and minuses of this type of screen being, being further, uh, having less distance from the screen works better. This is a nice amount of distance to the light source too, so um, I wish I could show you it, but I don't have a good way to, I don't have a good way to flip a camera around that way, do I? Probably not. Um, so... Let's take a look now. What I want to do, uh, let's see if this will work. Can I switch you to a, let's pop my camera switcher in here and see if it'll let me go to down shooter. Nope, let me go click it. I don't think that the app has focus, so it doesn't want to do that. Let's jump to bench cam there. Oh, it needs a focus. And let's put the main cam right there. Hide that one. And I'll, I'll key that main cam. So let's go here. Turn on the keyer. There we go. That works pretty well. Uh, so let me, let me head over here and focus that and zoom in a little bit. And I'll show you this is the start of a, uh, a second one that I'm going to work on. So let me move this out of the way and put some parts in view there so I can see them and focus. There we go. Uh, so this is the build. Let me actually, let me get closer. Uh, oh, is that not key? I forgot to tell it. Sorry. I forgot to push the live button and, and push that image. So let me do this for you. There we go. Um, So this is the parts, and I actually have a, a, another one of the rings coming, uh, 3D printing right now. I'll, I'll actually just detach this one in a second to show you. Um, but this is the method. So I, so I said that uh, 
Todd, Kurt showed us a cool way of plugging the encoder right into the Cutie Pie. So uh, what we've got to do is just clip off the little uh, extra legs on the side there. And then this, I'm going to forget which way it goes, but I think it's like that. I might have gotten that absolutely backwards, but uh, yes, no, I think it's the other way because that's not going into ground. So ground, yeah, I won't try to guess on this. Um, but I think it's roughly something like that. Uh, we end up with the encoder and the encoder's uh, built-in button all plugged in and ready to go. I'll show you the code in a second, which reassigns some of those pins so that all works. And then I ran some wires to the NeoPixel ring uh, so that this will, will drive it. A uh, couple tips, use some Kapton tape or other insulating tape on the bottom of the Cutie Pie before you plug the encoder in, since there's often metal on the base there that you don't want to short anything with. Uh, and then what I think I'm going to do, I'm going to write up a guide on this, and what I think I'm going to do for uh, the sort of nicer version of this is, is work on the case a little bit and also use a detachable um, extension. This is one of these little four position, we only need three, but this is a four position uh, wire cable bundle thinger dinger. Uh, plug one side of that into the light, one side into the cutie pie, and then we can connect these when we want to or disconnect them. Maybe use a different controller. I've seen some people, uh, there's at least a couple of people, by the way, on the web who have shown some really good versions of this uh, and, and have even gone as far as to use remote controls like an Arduino driving the lights and a little IR remote or RF remote so they can uh, stand over here and turn the thing on and off and change the, uh, the values. Let's see, does this work now? Yeah, it does. Oh, but that's, a, that's one that, that didn't key out. That's funny. That's picking a non-keyed version. Um, and let's see. So, yeah, so that's what the build looks like. Let me head back over here and we'll take a look at the code that I have on here, which is dead simple. And actually, before I even do that, one thing I, I didn't want to forget to do was show you. Um, let's show you where to get this material. Again, I'm going to write this up in the guide. Um, but if we bring this in here, yeah, we can just do it like that. Uh, I have found sources on eBay for uh, pretty inexpensive. So your question might be like, is this cost thousands of dollars? There are commercial versions of this that definitely cost thousands of dollars. However, uh, Cutie Pie is $6.00. The rotary encoder is a couple bucks. The NeoPixel ring, I think, is 15 or, or so. Uh, maybe a USB cable. And then the material here is, uh, here's someone selling it for $9 a yard at 49 inches in width, which is actually wider than the stuff I have here. And I, I this, they only have, oh, they say they have more than 10 available. So they have, hopefully they have a lot of it. I haven't ordered from this particular seller. Um, and I'm trying to remember, what is this stuff called? 3M uh, reflective scotch light. That's it, right? Scotch, scotch light fabric. Yeah, so you'll, you'll often find this in strips of tape that you can add safety markers to. But now I think uh, there's, there have been some clothing designers who've used it, not just for jackets, but skirts and things like that. Um, if you, if you look on 3M site, you can find out more about it. Oh, not on this page though. Uh, but if you, if you search for either scotch light fabric or reflective fabric or retro reflective, uh, and uh, you'll, you'll find some good sources for that. Um, by the way, I said that I would tell you, um, more about retro reflective. I, I, I can't remember if we answered this exactly, but retro means self. So the fact that it reflects back uh, upon itself. The source hits the thing and comes directly back. Uh, and that's the power of this, is that these beads, they kind of give us a directionality that is adjustable. So if the camera is looking through this ring, it's getting a perfect reflection back. Um, so wherever the light source is, these spheres allow it to, to bounce back. So even at pretty oblique angles, this, this stuff still works. In fact, uh, I can 
can probably pivot this. Let me pull my, oh, I'm gonna break things if I try that. Let's see, here's what I'll do. I'm just gonna take that off of there. You can see this stuff is just sort of a vinyl-y, plastic-y material. Um, as I, there we go. As I take this material, even though I'm going at crazy angles, unless it self obscures itself, it still works. So can you tell I'm excited about this stuff? I'm really thrilled with how well this works. I'm, I'm just blown away. Uh, and huge thanks, by the way, to my friend, Peter Moyer, who um, hipped me to this and showed me a, a shoot. He had done a video shoot using this material and he gave me this, this roll of it that I have, a couple yards of it, um, which have been really helpful in, in exploring this. So, so thanks to Peter. Um, and let's take a look now at the code. Uh, Larry Priest says, were you cold today? Lots of shirts. I'm actually hot now. Why am I wearing all these shirts? Oh, you know what? My mic is on this one. Can I? This is an interactive show. If you um, alert me to the fact that I'm probably wearing too many layers, I will probably strip. I mean, within reason, you know? Thank you know. That's better. Oh. All right, uh, let's see. The code, here we go. Oh, look, <laughs> we're seeing through. I don't even know what's being chroma there, but we're seeing through to that, that background again. Uh, so there's our code. I like that, I like that backdrop. How about, uh, there, that'll work. So this is very simple. It's uh, taking the Time library, just because I wanted to do some debouncing, so use some sleep. Board library, I import that so that I can get some pin definitions. Digital IOs using digital in, out, direction, and pull, and that's so we can use the button on the encoder and the encoder. Uh, NeoPixel library and the rotary IO library. So the rotary IO library is great. It makes it really easy to use rotary encoders. Uh, I established some colors, pure green, pure blue, Pure white, this happens to be an RGBW encoder, like I said, or a, a NeoPixel ring. Don't need that at all. Um, I just used it because it was there. I think the second one I'm gonna build is using just a regular RGB ring. And I call it black, but it's off. It's all, all the diodes at zero. Then I created a little array or list of those color names so that I could flip through them every time I click the button. You'll see uh, click blue, click white, click off, click green. And then the dim value is what I'm using as the brightness of the NeoPixels. Establish our NeoPixel ring. Here is, let's see, here's, here's where some of the cool stuff that Todd figured out comes from. The pin that we're using on this is the board uh, MISO from the SDA. Um, not SDA, from the, not I squared C, but what's the other one? Oh, I've, I've lost my, I've lost all knowledge. Uh, but it's one of the pins that is n not n normally used for this kind of stuff. We're, we're using that, we're picking that pin to be the NeoPixel pin, instead of like D6 that you might normally find. Um, and this one's RGBW, so it does need to be given a pixel order. We can ignore that if we're using the regular, uh, what is it? BGR, I think is the normal order. Uh, then we fill the pixel with the current color, show the ring. Uh, the SPI, thank you, Todd. Yeah, the SPI pin. Uh, then we use ring show to turn on. So I turn it on green as soon as it starts. Then we set up the button here. This is using the other SPI pin, the MOSI. Uh, the fake ground. So this is kind of cool. Since we plug the uh, let me turn this white so that's a better illuminator. There we go. Since we plug that uh, rotary encoder in just where it happens to lie, we, we don't get one of, there's only one ground actually on the, uh, on the device. Oh, you know what, I can kind of go to the overhead here. We can go to this down cam. Um, since the Encoder is plugged in uh, with pins three on one side and two on another. There's only one ground pin on here. So what, uh, what Todd came up with was calling the board A2 pin a ground. 
And the way this is done is by just setting its direction to output and setting its value to false. And this allows you to use it as a ground, which is super clever. Uh, then the encoder is set up at, using rotary I.O., incremental encoder. The pins that it's on are A3 and A1. We print a little hello statement. If you're debugging this, it's nice, nice to see your board has woken up. The encoder uh, state is saved with this variable here, last encoder value, is the whatever the current encoder position is. So when we go change it, we can compare it, see if we're going up or down in the encoder, increasing or decreasing incrementing or decrementing. The ring position I don't use, the rainbow position I don't use, those were left over from code I swiped from Todd, sorry about that, you heard that right now. Last time, this is, uh, I don't think I'm using this either, I think Todd was using a, a timeout. He built a media encoder knob, like a Griffin power knob for, for adjusting your volume or sending MIDI messages, things like that, mouse and keyboard messages, and he had a, a ring on it. The Main code here, the main loop, is checking, uh, creates a, if there's a difference between the current encoder position and the previous or the last encoder uh, value, then we know we've gone um, one way or another. And then we update that state so that it keeps being relevant each time. Then if the button is pressed, so the button goes low, it's false, we change the current color by flipping through the available um, indexes, uh, indices of that list that I made. So it goes between green, blue, white, black. Fill the colors, turn on the ring, and a little bit of a sleep. I just don't want to accidentally click in it. I hold it a little too long and it flips twice. I made it a pretty generous half second. So you're not going to click quickly through this. If you do, it'll get ignored, in fact. So click one, click two. If I click quickly, it only went one. Uh, then we wait for the encoder value to change. So if the difference between the last and the current is greater than zero, that means we're headed counterclockwise and I dim the value. If it's the other way, it's clockwise and I increase the value. And then I use our old friend modulo here so that I'm increasing by 0 0.1 in the brightness value. Uh, means what I get, 100 uh, it might be too much, but I get 100 clicks of the encoder wheel to go all the way up and down. We can adjust that. If you want that to be twice, twice as fast, you can change it to something like that. Uh, and then when it gets up to 1.0, it flips back around. And that is it. That's all the code that's running on there. It's actually fairly simple. The cool part of this project really is the, uh, I think, is, is that thing right there. Um, and I'll show you, actually, I, I, I didn't demo this, but we can, uh, yeah, we got a few more minutes. I think Scott is on after this. So if you want to see uh, Tan Newt, Scott Shawcroft talking about, uh, I think, some of the latest adventures in RP2040. That's my guess of what he's up to today. Uh, you'll want to tune in after this, so I'll, I'll make sure I am before two. Uh, I'm going to turn this back on. I'm going to turn this to blue. And you can see we're not knocking anything out. Wait, let's see. Did it, did it work on on green? Okay, so I'm on green. I'll turn on my keyer. Turn uh, the Adafruit factory back on. We'll switch to blue. It, it tries. There's, uh, I've got quite a threshold on what it allows, but uh, actually it's kind of a fun effect. Uh, so what we do is we specify blue. Let's see how well it, it works knocking out blue. So I'm going to pick my layer. Try that again. There we go. Uh, so now this is a blue, the, the, the blue you see on here is pretty close to what, uh, those are the same camera view really. Uh, so I can, I can go and adjust this, you'll see. I can make that dimmer. Right about there, there's a little noise, see that noise uh, right there? So it's, it's just not getting enough of that light. Also my hands are a little bit in the way. So I can bump that up, bump that up. Very bright. Nice. And get close up to it. This is a blue shirt, but navy blue is nowhere close to that. I don't know what these weathermen were, were allegedly wearing. I'm not... It's 30 years ago when these changes were made, so I'm sure things have changed, but uh, it's probably analog keying. But I don't know. Who's wearing that smurfy blue? I don't have anything against it, but I'm not wearing it. Uh, all right. So... Uh, oh, yeah, the light's hitting the shirt. You're right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, look at that. We are knocking me out. So let's... Let me... I, I'm I'm a I'm a liar. Uh, let me let me adjust the threshold and see. So 
there I'm saying don't use anything that diverges too much from the pure blue. Yeah, you're right. You can see through me a little bit. You can see through me right there. Okay. So I'll, I'll eat my words there. You definitely don't want to be wearing the blue shirt and using the blue screen. So I'm going to switch this to green. I just have to reselect uh, color I'm using. And now look, no see-through shirt. You probably could have, I, I should have switched the background. You see it more clearly there. I am not transparent anymore, am I? No, not much. A little bit over there. Let's adjust that. Threshold. Darken that a little bit. All right. That works well. Uh, you can also, like I said, you can use this for real, real compositing. So not real-time stuff, but but. Uh, pick that color. Let me get a more saturated version of it. How about that? That looks good. Yeah. Um, so you could film with this and then take your footage and go into a, a real compositing app. Um, just an aside, by the way, the DaVinci Resolve software is free and it's terrific pro-grade software. When I worked in the film industry, there were uh, software packages from DaVinci used all the time for uh, particularly color correction, color grading, but it's pro-grade stuff. People often ask, what should I use? Don't grab like Windows Movie Maker or whatever exists. Learn DaVinci Resolve. I, I happen to use Premiere Pro just because I've used it for many, many years and I don't uh, have a reason to stop, but it costs a lot of money. It's part of the, the Adobe suite. If you're looking for a free piece of software that can do all the compositing, editing. It also has a, a full suite of uh, audio, has effects, all that stuff built in. DaVinci Resolve is, is pretty great. I've recommended it to a few friends who've had um, great success with it. Also my son and a lot of his friends who've been compositing stuff for their, uh, for their school acting and, and uh, performance stuff have, have learned it. Um, let's see. Yeah, looking over at the YouTube. Thank you. Yes, Scott. SPI was the word I was looking for. <laughs> it just went out of my head. Uh, I look better than a wig on a skull. Thank you, Matambole. <laughs> That's the nicest thing anyone said to me today. Uh, it could be Keith Richards. Yeah. Where'd that skull go? Look at that guy. Uh, so yeah, again, look, that, that is actually trying to chroma key right now. I've got my light right here. I'll key myself again. Chroma key me. Right, so I'm I'm keyed with this light because this light is right here. If we look at uh, that camera, where are you? Over there. Maybe I can point this light that way, but really it ha it kind of has to be on axis with that lens. So if I bring this over here, let's let me just make sure that this is yeah that should be should be good. As I bring this, I just have it plugged into a little lipo battery and uh, power boost. I bring this over here. Aha. So there it is, right? There's my little contraption. Sit us over the lens and perfect. Gorgeous key. Look at that. All right. Uh, I think you get the idea. I'm really happy with this. Really impressed with it. It's, uh, by the way, this isn't a necessarily an incredibly new idea. There's a, there are versions of this that go all the way back to front projection technology used for... Uh, excuse me, used for film effects to put characters in front of essentially projections, either a projection of a still or even projection of film uh, using retroreflective screens. This is like a really, really super goosed up version of what you see in a movie theater. So movie theaters have some level of, of uh, retroreflection, so you get a really nice bright image on them. But this type of full, full on retroreflective screen was used, I, I, the example you often hear is 2001 Space Odyssey for some of the um, monolith apes scenes that was all done um, with, uh, with a front projection technology. And then at some point, uh, people started to realize they could just hit it with a, with a really pure uh, green like that, um, which is amazing and great. So uh, thanks, thanks you all for, for stopping by today. Uh, let's go back to Mars for a minute here. I can get a big version of me there. Uh, head back to Mars, and uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. that's going to do it for today. So uh, 
Frayed Fruit Industries. I'm John Park. This is John Park's Mars Landscape, and I will see you next week. Bye-bye. I won't go away. I'm just right here in front of it.